Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the correlates of war, and we are continuing to ask the question, how do we measure war? Last time we looked at militarized interstate disputes. These were conflicts that were small scale and up that didn't even need to involve a casualty. And in contrast, the correlates of war data set is going to be looking at larger scale conflicts as the name correlates of war might imply. So the way correlates of war defines an interstate conflict is as sustained combat between regular armed forces of two states, with at least 1,000 combat fatalities in total, and with each side having at least 100 combat fatalities on its own, or at least 1,000 armed forces involved in the conflict. Now just to be clear, what this is ruling out is the following. First, it rules out civil wars. The reason that civil wars can't be on this list is that we need to have armed forces of two states fighting each other, and in a civil war you have the armed forces of two entities within one state fighting each other. This also rules out extra-state wars. An extra-state war, for example, would be the United States versus Al-Qaeda. The United States is a state, but Al-Qaeda is not a sovereign entity. It does not have a part in the sovereign system, so it doesn't count as a state, so we cannot have two states fighting each other in that case. This also rules out any sort of massacre of civilians. So, for example, if I were to go into your country today and massacre 10,000 of your civilians, yes, that would get us over 1,000 fatalities, but we need to be having a war here involving combat fatalities. So that 10,000-person massacre on its own is not going to cause this to count as a war in the correlates of war data set. The 1,000 uh, casualty threshold does, however, rule out any sort of small-scale skirmishes. So what we saw in those militarized interstate disputes, for example, might be a situation where we mobilize troops to our border and we start firing at each other and, you know, 150 people die in that case. Well, that's not going to count as a war. It's just going to count as a militarized interstate dispute because we're not seeing a large magnitude of people dying here. So there's a break there between a militarized interstate dispute and a war. Lastly, we need to have balance here. So if I were to fight your military on the other side and sustain very few casualties and just completely wipe out your side, then that's not going to count as a war unless you had at least 1,000 guys defending yourself or you were at least able to inflict 100 combat, uh, combat fatalities on me. This is, again, just to make sure that there's some sort of balance and actual uh, fighting between the two parties in a military sense and not just massacring. So that's your correlates of war rules. And while I understand that you might have some issues with this, for example, you might complain that we only have 999 combat fatalities in a particular conflict that would not count as a war. And yet if one extra person had died, suddenly that would count as a war. Yeah, I understand that you might have some problems with this and I can sympathize with that. But nevertheless, if we use these rules and definitions, we can actually look at some graphs and find some very interesting trends in war over time. The first graph I want to show you is the number of states starting a war in any given year. This is again from 1816 to 2010. What we see here are two things. First, the most common outcome is for no state to be starting a war in any given year. You can see that by just looking along the horizontal zero axis there. There are a lot of dots there and fewer dots anywhere else in the graph. That means that war is rather infrequent. Yes, there might be a war going on in the world in any given year, but most states are not fighting a war in most years. And in fact, most states have no reason to be starting a war in most years. So that's good. That's reassuring. That's saying, hey, the world isn't as bad as it might seem by just looking at the nightly news. The other thing that is worth noting here is that the number of wars going on seems to be rather constant starting from about the mid 1800s. So in the first 30 or 40 years of the data set, we see that there aren't very many conflicts being started in the world. But then after that, we're seeing a sustained number going on in the world. Now, this is a little bit misleading. Just like last time when we looked at the militarized interstate disputes, the problem that we noted was that there are just more states in the world now than there are or there were back in the early 1800s. So instead of looking at this as the number of states starting a war in any given year, we can instead look at the portion of states starting a war in any given year, and we see a different story. Yes, there are very few wars being started in the early 1800s following the Napoleonic Wars, but if we look over time, we're seeing after that 
there to be fewer and fewer wars occurring, especially if we look at what's going on from World War II afterward. So there's a lot of conflict in World War II, but then after World War II ends, in the Cold War era, we're not seeing very many states getting themselves involved in war. And in fact, in the post-Cold War era, we're seeing even fewer states getting themselves involved in war. And we can see this even more clearly with a five-year moving average. So you can see, again, looking from World War II afterward, we see a sudden drop-off and sustained relative peace in the world uh, in contrast to what we might have been seeing during the World War I to World War II eras. So the world that we're living in now is sometimes known as the long peace. We're in the long peace era. This is reflecting the fact that wars have been trending downward following World War II, and perhaps more importantly, there have been zero wars between major powers in that post-World War II period. A major power is a country like the United States or China or Russia, countries that have the ability to project power in great quantities over long distances. Unfortunately, it's still not clear whether this long peace is the product of chance or an actual underlying phenomenon going on in the world. There just hasn't been that much time pass between the last major power war, World War II, and today to know, statistically speaking, whether this is just the product of random luck or the product of something that's actually good in the world, like more peace actually being something that's sustainable over time. Now, on the other hand, there are many theories that assume that this piece is growing more prevalent, and a lot of researchers trying to explain why that's the case. And that's something that we're going to be going on about further as we go along in this course. But again, bear in mind here, it's still not clear whether that this is just blind luck that we haven't had that many wars recently, or we're actually seeing something uh, going on in the world that's going to make the world more peaceful. Regardless of the long piece, though, perhaps the more important question is, are you more likely to die in a war today than you were a long time ago? And as it turns out, things are actually looking up there as well. Now, this is the number of battle deaths per year assigned all of those deaths to the year in which the war started. So what we see here is a bunch of casualties from World War I and a bunch of casualties from World War II, and then very few other wars actually making a mark on this graph. So this is very high and very random with a lot of years with not having any conflicts being started and not having any casualties and a few conflicts very few conflicts namely world war one world war two korean war vietnam war and the iran iraq war which are providing the minor blips on your screen or in the case of world war two and world war one those major blips so perhaps a better way of looking at this is the number of battle deaths per year assigned again to the year in which the war started as a 20-year moving average. And what we see in this 20-year moving average is, yes, a spike during World War One and a spike during World War Two. But if we look at the era today, this post-Cold War era, we're seeing very few casualties per year relatively in line with what we saw in the early 1800s, with the major difference being, of course, that there are a lot more people in the world today than there were back then. So what we're seeing overall is relatively good things in the world, relatively more peace in the world, relatively fewer people dying in wars in the world today than in the past, especially the, well, recent generational past for the World War I and World War II eras. But once more, it's unclear whether this is statistical luck or actually reflecting something good about the world. So that's your correlates of war data set for you in a nutshell. There's some of the more interesting things that we can find in it. I hope you enjoy this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.